Our studio back with Professor Ahmed Samatar, International Study of MacArthur College. Uh, Professor Samatar, we're talking about Arab Spring and how it became, you know, transform or be changed from young, youth, secular, mm -hmm. really going for you know dignity and democracy and and uh, it, it, then we we'll talk about the role of Islamists then and, and, and you know most of this Arab world has. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Islam is a huge part of their history, of their mm -hmm. culture, of their identity. Mm -hmm. And it, the Islamists did very well at the end, mm -hmm. or the second phase of the, mm -hmm. of the uh, Arab Spring, you know, Tunisia and Egypt and all that. Mm -hmm. And then they were put down, stifled, fought to, whatever. Mm -hmm. Then we have now the, an, inspira an inspiration of more militant mm -hmm. uh, Islamists, mm -hmm. and then the phenomenon of ISIS. Mm -hmm. You know, I know the invasion of Iraq and breakdown. Mm -hmm. We don't know exactly what ISIS is, but uh, mm -hmm. the phenomenon of ISIS, mm -hmm. it really it means so many things to so many people. Mm -hmm. And we don't know exactly what ISIS is, but it also, it, all we know is a reflection mm -hmm. of the desperation mm -hmm. of a lot of people in that area. Mm -hmm. So well, what's I, your I, take I, on ISIS? Yeah, ISIS, uh, from my point of view, uh, is made up of at least in the broad sense, two kinds. Uh, those, and maybe this is the core, uh, individuals uh, who found the decomposition of the Saddam Hussein state yeah. uh, so disagreeable, uh, whether they are Sunnis or whether they are other groups. But those who found themselves, the death of the Saddam Hussein regime was their loss. Uh, and the change has therefore uh, marginalized them. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, one group. And some of them really are heavy duty Ba'athists, mm -hmm. uh, whether they are generals or whether they are other tacticians and strategists, or whether they are other professional people, or whether they are average people. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, one group. And it is heavily Iraqi uh, for a, a group. Uh, and then, I think, uh, groups that have been fighting the regime in, uh, in Syria, uh, who also find themselves having some kinship. Uh, with that, and maybe again there might be Sunnis, mm -hmm. at least in terms of the branch of Islam. Uh, so that's one group. Uh, in many ways, they are organic to the area, yeah, whether it is in Syria mm -hmm. or whether it's in Iraq. Uh, and then I think that th th the second group really are people who are coming from outside, very little to do uh, with the, either the Iraq uh, or, or Syria, uh, but they are international jihadists, uh, and they have their own sense of the uh, rehabilitation of Islam as a civilization, mm -hmm. uh, and that yearning for something like that, which sometimes might be quite uh, uh, utopian in many ways. Uh, but you can see that, and they are mostly young people who could easily be bamboozled uh, into that kind of a project, whether they are here in the United States or Germany or, or the United Kingdom or mm -hmm. uh, other parts of Europe or even certain parts of Africa and, and, and Asia. But being bamboozled by, by this propaganda of yeah. ISIS yeah. must have a, a reason why yeah. you should be easily, instead of being a British mm -hmm. citizen or yeah. A, yeah. A, a, an Engl Americans or whatever, yes. Uh, your condition yeah. and your, your identity in yeah. that particular society yeah. has been marginalized. It's yes. been uh, kind of questioned. Yes. You're not Pakistani, yeah. you're not British, yeah. and then now you are ISIS. You yeah. are uh, part of this Khalifa begin. Yeah. So as we, you said in the beginning, we, we, we cannot ignore our contribution as Muslims and Arabs of mm -hmm. the problem. Yeah. Well, also, we cannot marginalize or uh, the contribution of the West mm -hmm. and its relationship of Islam and Muslim yeah. for the last oh, few years. I, I agree with you. I mean, I'm giving a lecture at McAllister College uh, on uh, December, I think, uh, 4th or 5th. I think it's December 4th mm -hmm. uh, in the evening at McAllister College. And it is about this question, and that is... Uh, Muslims in the age of globalization, yeah. and they struggle for the future. That's yeah. happening in front of us. Exactly. Uh, and I think the combination of, of, of Muslim society's own inadequacies 
Uh, and of course, the ambition of uh, imperial dominance mm -hmm. uh, of the West that has deep historical roots. The combination of those two, I, I think, create a context mm -hmm. uh, in which many Muslim peoples, young people particularly, find themselves uh, thinking about alternative ways of thinking. But that is the real challenge, isn't mm -hmm. it? And that's alternative way of thinking. And my argument has been for the last 15 years uh, that in fact the challenge for Muslim peoples, whether they are in the Middle East or whether they are here or whether they are in other parts of the world, is to do a number of things at the same time. One of them, yeah, there is Muslim peoples, but there are different cultures and there are different histories, yes, even different races yeah. that are Muslims. Mm -hmm. So those particularities will have to be honored and respected and not create some kind of a homogeneous, uh, top-down project of Islamization, okay. and political Islamization. Mm -hmm. Second thing is, I think, synthesis. And that is, how does one go about retrieving what is glorious about Islamic culture and, and, and civilization mm -hmm. and one's own identities, and then link to other parts of the world where there are also good things that have happened? Yes, and it is the making of that synthesis which requires enormous investment in education, for example, in freedom of expression and freedom of research. But the inventiveness, the innovation uh, to bring those two together and then create a context in which you, you are able to retrieve workable traditions from your own past and then linked to what has worked for other peoples uh, too and working for other peoples. And out of that, then, Islamic civilization, with all of these differences and multiplicity of cultures, and this is must not, be revived. Not, this is nothing new. I mean, yeah. Islam had that glorious time where it was yes. inclusive, yes. brought yes. people, yes. mostly non-Arabs. But this is, this is why, and this is part of my lecture on December mm -hmm. uh, you know, 4th in, in, at McAllister, uh, to first of all get a sense of what were the basis for that rise over 800 years. Yeah. Uh, most of the people in the world and scholars at this present time agree that this was the most brilliant civilization of its time for nearly 800 years. So you have to understand how did that come to be and what were the great high points. Yeah. But then at the same time, you had to, you have, one has to understand why did it begin to wane yeah. Yeah? and then get defeated. Yeah, and the humiliation that comes well, along Until today, that. I still yeah, don't that's know. Right. That's right. Well, maybe you can come to my lecture. Uh, and, and when you understand that, and some of it were endogenous, some of the failures were inside, endogenous. For example, issue of succession. Who is going to rule, for example, became a major problem rather uh, significantly. And with the, which will create in de internal decay of power and civil strife, assassination. The word assassin is Arabic. It is roots. Uh, you know, so internal issues. And then the, the rise of the West, which borrowed a lot from the Islamic world, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, revived itself to come out of what the historians generally call the Dark Ages. Uh, and then that rise created uh, a time in which the civilization in the Mediterranean, for example, in which Egypt was a very central uh, country as a transmitter of trade in mm -hmm. the Mediterranean, moved to the Atlantic by the 16th century. You can see that taking, moving place. Mm -hmm. And the Atlantic becoming the hub of international trade, okay? And ever since. Uh, so uh, understanding, I think, uh, the rise of Islam as a civilization, that was a beacon for, I think, civilized people around mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. And what it has achieved. And then it is a decline in where it is now. That requires a very serious study on the part of Muslim peoples. And it's not going to be a jihadist project. It has to be a, a kind of a creative, uh, synthetic uh, are project. The, are are, are, are uh, Muslim or Islam uh, uh, the only one has monopoly on jihadists? Not necessarily. We have, we have Wall Street jihadists. Yeah. For well, for I think for me, NATO is a jihadist project. Right. Fanaticism, fanaticism is found in all societies, and uh -huh. in all cultures, and all civilizations. Many scholars would argue, including myself, part of the reason why the West was able to conquer the rest was, among other things, not only superiority in weapons, yeah. not only superiority in terms of uh, administrative structures, and not only superiority in terms of uh, uh, health and disease. Uh, they had they, they, the diseases that they brought to those societies uh, were diseases that were not known in those societies, so they became vulnerable. But another important factor in the conquest by the West of the rest was really a certain degree of fanaticism, yeah. you see. Mm -hmm. So that is important to note. But the question is not to return uh, another fanaticism to respond to that old fanaticism, you see. Yes, the sir. question really is to think creatively. This is what I meant by synthesis, mm -hmm. civilizational synthesis. 
Islam at its best was but a sympathetic project <laughs> at its best. Uh, that could be the title of your recipe. Yeah. But, but is, it, is it possible, I mean, to, to see uh, the only forces yeah. now challenging uh, the uh, global uh, globalization, global market, or uh, you know, yeah. it's mostly. It, 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 might, it might be the last, uh, the last battle in many ways before commodification yeah, yeah. takes place uh, everywhere in the world. It might be the, these might be the last resistant consumers of commodification, yes. the Islamic world. Yeah. But the question really is this, and I want to repeat what I just said before, Ahmed, and that is the. The, the, the door to re-energizing of Islamic culture and civilization is not through a jihadist project. It is through deeper intellectual understanding of the history of that society. It is affinity with other civilizations, including the West. Yeah? But the West uh, doesn't want to play the game of, uh, of uh, affinity and working together. When you are supporting dictators, as a matter of fact, I was, was going to bring this up anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, foreign affairs, mm -hmm. which is the ayatollah of uh, intellectual right. uh, capitalists, whatever, right. had a, a huge article yes. about the post-Cold War or yes. whatever, and the yes. threat, whatever. Now, but let's talk about what, he, what they say about the Arab Spring and what happened in, yes, in, yes, in yes, Arab yes, yes. The author, yeah. which I think you know, must be endorsed by the... the yeah. His sense. argument uh -huh. that what caused all this chaos mm. are getting rid of the dictators mm -hmm. of Mubarak, our yeah. affinity, our yeah. our ally, yeah. getting rid of Saddam. Well, that, that, that's an old argument uh, on the on the part of particularly the right in yeah. the West, uh -huh. and that is to have their own, I think, what I will call political goons in many ways, yeah. to have their own in places yeah. uh, or vision in of what the world, world looks so like, so that they can keep the Arab street quiet. Yeah, and get crumbs, and get crumbs from the table of imperialism. Yeah. I mean, yes, I mean that that's an all. So but but let me just finish. But I think there are many many constituencies in the West, including here in the United States, that are progressive, that are authentically democratic, that would like to see a global politics and a global order. Where and are they? A relationship what, what between the, the United is. States. Huh? Where are they, and what their voices are? Well, I I, I with I, corporate I, media, I wouldn't see, I wouldn't hear it there very much. I, I agree with you that uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the core uh, of economic power in the United States has its own grip on global media. Yeah. I, I understand that. Many, many Americans will tell you that our own politics of democratic politics in the United States is being increasingly colonized by private money. Corporate. I agree with you. Yeah. This is what I Look meant at the by, last election. Yeah, but this is what I meant by this universal project of commodification and accumulation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's what I meant. But I think it is important, though, not to overlook that there are vast uh, numbers of American people at many different of their, uh, levels of their own consciousness, but who really are Democrats and, they will, and who are very gentle, kind people, and they would like to see their own country and other societies move in that direction. That's a struggle going on. But violence does not help anybody in, 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 the, in the ultimate project. On that hopeful note, thank you so much, thank Professor you, Samatar. Thank you. International Study of Macalester College. He's going to have a lecture in December. I think it's going to be published. Professor yes. check yes. with Macalester. Yes. And we'll see you next week. Salam alaikum and God bless you all. That's very nice. Sir. Thank you.